welcome to SL TLS Floors Tech. So the future, there's a few other things in there as well. Uh, basically, it's actually called TLS these days. Uh, SSL is the original name, but uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. So it's actually a protocol specification of how to do things securely, like uh, handshakes, <laughs> to start off a communication between a client and a server. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about that, and then also specifies how to encrypt the records which are being used to funnel the data between A and B, hence uses encryption. There's also quite a few different implement implementations of the standard, and I'll speak about that in a bit. <coughs> like that. Uh, so, boring SSL by Google, uh, you probably, Libre SSL is kind of famous these days. Uh, not that well known, but, well, he's not immediately known off the top of your head, but actually used by Mozilla Sun Microsystems, which is now Oracle, so quite a few. The famous OpenSSL. <coughs> These guys will get a special mention in a bit. Uh, yeah, Microsoft uses S-Channel, actually not the worst uh, SSL, TLS uh, sort of set of libraries that there are, surprisingly, perhaps. A uh, couple of things about uh, that I like about these ones, they're cut down implementations. If you think about complexity versus security, as you get more and more complex, you get a bigger and bigger attack surface. If you have more and more algorithms that are available, or cipher suites, for example, then if there's something wrong in them, then, uh, like, oops, okay, or your implementation is wrong of one of them, like, oops, that's, you know, the chance starts to increase that there's going to be a problem. And you can see this is, if you look at the reasoning why they cut cut things down in Libre SSL, like removing old cruft, uh, support for really old hardware and you know, strange architectures that nobody has anymore or hasn't had for ages, like why have it there? You know, nobody's even using it. Like, oh, backwards compatibility is very nice, but if you're supporting 386 in this day and age, you're being a little bit silly. Uh, and I mean like, not I386, I mean like the 386 16 bit kind of effort, 32 bit. Uh, special mention for RSA be safe. These guys took uh, money from the NSA at one point. Uh, <coughs> nice big contract, I think it was like 10 million dollars. Good way to throw away your reputation. Uh, technically it was 10 million dollars of work for the NSA so that the NSA could adopt it and then they could say, hey there's a US government uh, organization that has adopted this. It happens to be the NSA, we won't tell people that part. And Anyway, it, they influenced the decision of the random number generators and that's like random number generators because they're not so random. which quite a bad thing when you need randomness to make encryption work. Uh, OpenSSL, it will get a bit of attention in this talk. Uh, the reason being is it's very widely used and it's open source, so a lot of people can look at it. Um, the impact's also quite wide, uh, which we'll mention in some of the, the flaws and the attacks on those flaws later. It's on there. It's here? It's uh -uh. But this is not a complete list of everything. Uh, in fact, on some of the slides, I'll be like, and more, and go and see this. Uh, and I haven't even said go and see this a lot. What I will do is publish a whole set of uh, references, and there are great amounts of detail that you go in for each one of the attacks. I'm going to have a slide with a few points on it. <laughs> there are papers, academic papers, with you know, eight pages, ten pages, twelve pages of text, and that's cut down by their standards to make it fit in a small amount. It's quite detailed. So the brief history, though, is that this all started with. Netscape, and Netscape published this in, well, there we go, 1995, so we're going back a ways here. The other thing is then, you'll notice there's no SSL 1.1.0, it's not missing from the graph, it was just never published, so these are published standards. Uh, you can see at some point it became TLS 1.0, also read that it was actually, could have been 3.1, they decided to make it TLS 1.0 in 1999, and <coughs> that's no longer a Netscape specific thing, it's far more vendor, widely used, standard or protocol. So yeah, I can see the timeline. Uh, other interesting things, you can see we're currently here in terms of currently released published one, that's 2008, August <coughs> as I recall. So a fair amount of time. 1.3 has been like promised to us for a while now, uh, that's far on this side here. The star that I said hasn't actually been released yet, it's now on draft 20. So <coughs> they originally thought it was going to be released by February, which had obviously shifted out already to get to February. Clearly it hasn't been released yet. There's some good reasons for that, and I'll speak a lot about TLS 1.3 at some point, if that was your question. Okay, cool. Well, you can ask the questions maybe when I get to that section, and then it makes sense. So what is SSL TLS good for? Uh, so 
clearly secure communication between the client and the server, uh, which is useful. Uh, authentication, so establishing and verifying the identity. Uh, we typically think about this in terms of certificates. So you, you get a certificate uh, which is signed by a CA, and that certificate is signed based on the certificate signing request that you generate on your server, which is based on your private key, which is private. And so you take the CSR, you go to the CA, and the CA goes like, yep, we verify you. Sometimes it's a phone call, sometimes they're looking up to see if your business actually exists, etc., like that. And they're basically just saying, yeah, the person who has the certificate is who they say they are. And your browser has some certs that it trusts the, uh, of the, the root, which is the CA, and maybe some intermediate certs as well. And basically it's just a chain of trust. So that's kind of where we come into authentication. Um, privacy, confidentiality, what most people think about when it comes to encryption. And we're talking about uh, communication happening across a network. So we're talking about encrypting a communication channel, not encrypting data at rest in this talk. Uh, data integrity, uh, kind of trying to see if your message has been tampered with. So you're communicating with somebody and it's encrypted. Well, great, okay. Is somebody messing with it though? And like, that's important to know. Um, TLS has got something called, uh, there we go, message authentication code. It's basically a checksum equivalent. And you have the message before you encrypt it, you calculate the MAC, and then you concatenate it, and then you encrypt that whole lot together, and that gets sent across. The other side decrypts it, they can check the MAC and go like, yep. They can compute it again and check that the message hasn't actually been altered. So, very basic uh, concept at least, and very useful. <coughs> so, I'm not going to give you a deep dive into this, otherwise we'd need like a whole evening just for, and I don't mean two hours, I mean like five, six hours to start really getting into this. But if you start with the handshake portion, which I mentioned before, then if you think about, if you've got public key, cryptography is going to be involved and data is going to get, get exchanged, kind of obvious. What's actually going on here and why we're doing it in this fashion is a little bit more interesting. So you've got asymmetric, often known as public key. We've got a public key and a private key uh, cryptography, which tends to be slower than its symmetric private key when you've got a shared key. So the key, when I say shared key, I mean the key is used to encrypt and decrypt uh, the information that you're encrypting. In public key, you use the public key to encrypt it and the private key to decrypt it and actually vice versa. <coughs> um, so what they kind of do is start with the public key because that's slow, but it's secure, and it solves the problem of key exchange, which is why we have public private key, sorry, public uh, key pairs in the first place. And <coughs> the public key is actually in the certificate. If you have a look at the, uh, the certificate, you find the public key of the server. So using that, the client can actually say like, hey, uh, here I am, and encrypts the stuff using that public key, which then only the server can decrypt using its private key. And once they've set up their little session, then they can actually start going, okay, we're gonna use this, key here for symmetric, uh, you know, nice and fast purposes, and there we go. So trying to get the best of both worlds, if that makes any sense, you know, you use the really robust stuff that handles the key exchange problem, and then off that, you know, once we've set it up, now we can use that to exchange that key and quickly communicate. So the more interesting part of the talk, now that we've got the primer out the way, <coughs> is flaws and attacks. So as with all things, nothing's perfect, and, um, you know, Encryption is actually tough when it's done right. You know, people have really put a lot of effort into it. The guys are smart. You know, they've had a whole lot of people looking at it and pulling it apart and proving that it's, you know, mathematically sound. So how do we break it? And I say break in inverted commas here because that, that's not really breaking it, is it now? Um, using a side channel isn't really breaking it either. And asking an oracle, well, that's technically not breaking it either. So yeah, like three methods of not breaking encryption to actually get around encryption. Well, three categories, I should say. We will look at those. Now. So, side channel attacks, which I'm not actually going to spend that much time on, but, for example, power consumption is very interesting. So, if you have a chip and it's doing encryption and decryption, so you're putting work into it and it's transforming that result. And, yeah, let me just, as soon as I finish that one, you can jump in. So, what you can do is you can look at the power usage of that chip. And then you can see how it varies as you put different bits of information through this. And what you do is you hook up some really nice fancy oscilloscopes, that kind of thing, and you start seeing what's happening. Uh, okay, maybe oscilloscopes are a bit more for timing as well. Uh, but it's a similar concept. You're putting different things in, and you're seeing what happens. Like, does the timing change? Does the power consumption change? Uh, sorry, Hendrik, you were just ask a question? 
No, I actually wanted to make a statement when you finished the slide. Okay, cool. Uh, there's another. There's another one of side channel attacks. There's a lot of side channel attacks. Cash. Uh, on this one. Yeah, cool. So cash accesses. If you've got a, a VMware platform or a Hyper-V platform or a uh, Linux kernel KVM type setup, when the virtual machine is actually accessing the cache, if you can snoop that cache, you can start to find out really interesting things about what the CPUs, the virtual CPUs, are doing, um, which could be useful for extracting some piece of critical information like the keys that are being used in the encryption. So. You see what we're doing? We're not actually breaking the encryption. We're not saying like this mathematically encoded you know, piece of data, which is now indecipherable. We're not going to go and figure out how to reverse that. What we're doing is figuring out a way around it. Uh, electromagnetic, it's EMI radiation, things like fine air radiation. Uh, so literally seeing what the machine is doing. Uh, you want to jump in quickly? Do you have sense? I read today. Um on version 2.5, they are going to not support a CPU that does not support AES and I on the chip. Mm -hmm. yep. For the simple reason, these attacks. Yep. Um, they found, they, they actually have a reference to a research paper mm -hmm. where people <coughs> was using attacks on the CPU to get those information from the encryption as it happened. And the only way to not do that is or could not get that information was to use the AES in I an instruction set inside the job. Yeah. Is that specific to OpenSSL? Um, no. <laughs> it is no, no, I'm just asking because uh, there's another project called OpenSense, I think, OPNSense, and they strictly use LibreSSL, and that's why they forked off PFSense. So I'm just trying to. <coughs> no, so it's all the encryption in PFSense, they want to move away from uh, software yeah. encoding yeah. and use the on chip one for yeah. those things. Pretty much builds on processes. No, they actually have a way of the on processes also have a crypto part on yeah. it that they will then use. <coughs> so basically, so totally read up on 2.5 yeah. PFSense decisions on that. Yeah, some very interesting stuff. And these are actually real world, so you can actually go look at real world attacks on these things. If you really can't find them, ask me and I'll tell you which ones I was watching. Some of the videos by like Intel CPU engineers, it's like, probably know what they're talking about when it comes to, you know, power and timing attacks. Acoustic analysis, eh, kind of sound thing. Differential fault analysis, so introducing different faults and seeing what happens. Again, it's all very, throw things in there, make it, and measure the, the difference. So, I'm not really that interested in that, so we're not going to talk about that for the rest of the talk. Uh, preventing side channels. Remove the leaking information. That's what Hendrik's talking about there. Or breaking the relationship. It's sometimes a very uh, fine distinction to make. So if there was a relationship between I feed in bigger numbers and, oh look, it takes uh, longer, then I'm, you know, if it's in smaller numbers and it takes shorter, then you can kind of start to infer that maybe you've got bigger numbers is the actual payload uh, that you're trying to decrypt because they would know what you're putting in, in terms of your plaintext. Uh, so yeah, soft, making software executions have to be independent. That sounds what like uh, what PFSense is trying to do there. They're trying to avoid having, uh, you know, being able to measure differences based on what you're putting in there and then infer. Uh, adding random delays is another example. Uh, you know, however, attackers do know how to average. So <laughs> you're throwing in the random delays and they're going like, yeah, well, let's just do ten runs then and see if we're like on average closer or further apart. Like your random numbers are going to get averaged out. It's either going to take longer or shorter. Uh, so, in case you thought it wasn't a problem, <laughs> so I actually just pulled up all the vulnerabilities from OpenSSL's website and I said, oh, well, let's draw a little graph. Uh, notice up to about here, which is about 2012 ish, 2013, things are, yeah, not great, but we kind of really took off here. So there's a couple of reasons why. One is people are already looking at it. Uh, based on a few big ones that were found. And, yeah, maybe... And diligent devs putting some uh, <coughs> vulnerabilities in? Yeah, I think the uh, efforts of various organizations to influence things might have started to be discovered, which might have been what spurred people to look at, take a closer look at this. So, of these vulnerabilities, we get different types of effects from this, impacts. Uh, you can have a, just a hang. Uh, if you can ma cause machines to hang on mass, the night of service. Okay. 
not so great in terms of breaking encryption or gathering secret data, but you know, it's still, you know, if you want to hurt somebody, that's one way to do it. Uh, if you can crash the application server, that can be useful, especially if the application server's got privileges that's running us. Uh, you've got the client application crash, maybe you can hijack somebody's machine that way, the client machine, I mean. And data leakage. I mentioned a real world example of the server's private keys being leaked, which, if you're paying attention at the beginning, is a very bad thing because the private keys are used for the CSR for the cert, so it's all broken, and you can use that to decrypt the traffic that you can intercept or copy or capture as it goes across the network, so not good. Two, two attack oracles. I picked these two specifically because of the real world examples that we're going to go through in a bit. Actually, these two show up more than once. Um, so what is an oracle? I suppose we should quickly dive into that. So, like the oracles in Greece, they didn't give you a direct answer. You couldn't ask them, like, what is the meaning of whatever this, or what is the answer to that? They wouldn't give it to you. But you, you could say something to them like, well, is it more like this, or is it more like that? And you'd get an answer like, yes, you're closer, or you're further away. Not very direct, but an answer that is still giving you something that will lead you closer to the answer or to the truth, hopefully. Um, and we'll mention that in the actual examples of how they work. So we're going to have nine actual attacks here. Um, some are implementation problems. Some are problems with the protocol. So for example, if OpenSSL, they're going to feature a few times here because I'm hard on them. Uh, if they make a mistake that's not actually following the specified protocol, that's their fault and not the protocol's, protocol's fault. And vice versa, obviously if there's a problem in the protocol, you'll actually see this happening across multiple uh, implementations because they're all following the standard and there's a problem with the standard in the specification and it's like, well, do it like this, do it like that. And then some attacker figures out, well, hang on, if we do it like this and we do it like that, we can start getting hold of a bit of information and we can start to determine what the actual uh, unencrypted payload was before was encrypted. That's bad. Uh, yeah, and various oracles, like I mentioned, they will be looked at. So I'll start with Hotly, which is one of my favorites. Left one or two little things off the slide, and we'll see if anybody can interject them. I think some people know what I'm talking about. Uh, does anybody know why it's called Heartbleed, for starters? With that name, why the name was chosen? Correct. So, SSL, for some strange reason, included a Heartbeat functionality. I'm pretty sure how useful that was to most people's use case, but it was there. Um, somebody introduced a bug. That's actually why this has got a uh, double date. So this flaw was introduced in 2012 and discovered in 2014. So, yeah, a little bit of a window there. Uh, why is this such a big thing? Why did it get so much attention? Well, it had a high impact. And how do you determine high impact? Well, it was widespread. If you look at uh, Apache Nginx, very large market share, a lot of people using it. And yeah, they use OpenSL, at least by default, and probably a lot of work to switch that off, or switch to something else. And this. When you get the words uh, remotely obtain the contents of memory, that is a bad, bad thing. That is probably the worst thing, especially when you go like, read things like the server's private key, which could well be a memory, especially if it's a web server that's using that to do HTTPS. Um, this is actually the remediation step, which I must remember to expand upon. Uh, so the solution was to patch OpenSSL on the box. You'll notice the new keys and new certs. So you're assuming the worst has happened. So you generate new keys, private key, you know, public or key pair. <coughs> do a new CSR, get a new C C or get your CA to issue a new cert, revoke your old cert. That gives you a, an idea of the scale of the cleanup operation that was required for one. So, yeah, can you remember when this commit was made on 2012? December, late December, very late. Yeah, right around Christmas. New Year's Eve, maybe even, when a whole lot of people were not really watching, which is slightly suspicious in some people's. Cloudflare had a similar problem earlier this year. Yep. Uh, hardware level, low level problem where Google, uh, Tavis, of Mandy, they discovered their cache, uh, OpenSSL, SSL, TLS, handshakes, that's called including random bits of memory, clear text memory. Uh, it's found that there was also a implementation bug, mm. uh, if statement or something like that, it wasn't actually matching correctly on a condition, and it just 
just dumped TFX in memory. Google had to purge all their caches. Yeah. They come from Cloudflare's page. Same difference, I think. We're not really interested in the names of the, what the yeah, vendors call their the products, but it's the same, yeah, it's the same problem. Uh, you don't want to be leaking the contents of your memory. That's bad, especially if it's, yeah, unencrypted. To some extent, that is a legitimate function, though. So something like perhaps a load balancer would want to check whether or not mm. SSL is still up without actually making a full handshake um, yeah. tunnel or everything. So, <coughs> Some people have better use for it. It's just a wrong implementation that was UK memory. So, Freak, or factoring RSA export keys, uh, mentioned export. So, it's a man in the middle attack, and basically it involves forcing a downgrade to the export ciphers. Sorry, export grade encryption ciphers. Uh, export is not like export quality wine or export is so good, this is exports are bad, kind of. US decides that way back when, encryption is munitions, and yeah, if you're going to have munitions, you're going to have smaller munitions than us, especially if you're using our stuff, so they try to uh, force down the, basically the quality and the strength and of the encryption ciphers that were being exported. So the remediation is remove the weak ciphers from your configs. If a server refuses to speak that, then it's not going to speak that. Same with the client. If it's not in your, for example, browser, uh, if it's not prepared to speak, I'll mention some of these. Uh, really uh, inappropriately uh, named export ciphers <coughs> a bit later. But if, if you can't speak it, you can't negotiate it, because that's what's happening in the first part, so of the handshake. So we've also got logjam. So it's a method for attacking Diffie Hellman. I've noticed I'm missing an F there. Too. Mm -hmm. So you know the key exchange. Uh, Diffie Hellman is very useful for perfect forward secrecy, so which is a good thing. Kind of means that the keys are used for the session that, or the, the communication session. Uh, it's like a key that gets generated often uh, based on the keys of exchange at the beginning. And so, doing so, if you do that, then if somebody compromises that session, uh, they first record the whole thing. If they get hold of the key later, then they can decrypt it. But if you're using keys that are rotating, then they can only decrypt that one session they got that key for. Uh, basically, through pre computation, they went short key lengths, it was possible to, uh, with a reasonable amount of resources, be able to decrypt uh, what was going on close to or near real time, if not real time. I suppose it depends who you are and what your reasonable amount of resources are. Uh, longer keys must be used. If you, you can easily find this with uh, Cisco's got a guide on it, and so does everybody else, really. Brutal. Although some of these are, I put here because. I've encountered them and had to deal with them in the cleanup, and some of them because they seem more applicable. Maybe afterwards, after I've done the top, my top nine, somebody else could volunteer one. Two. So, okay, just the name again. Uh, basically, it's a downgrade attack to SSL v3, and we'll mention, talk about SSL v3 in a bit more. Uh, vulnerable RC4, or the cipher block chaining encryption, uh, available in SSL v3. And basically, that was just weak and vulnerable to decryption, hence vulnerable. Uh, oh yeah, the block padding, so it was not covered by the Mac. Remember I mentioned the Mac right at the beginning? Uh, so that means you can start fiddling with the, map, with the padding, and guess what? It's not actually part of the hash, which when decrypted, you can take the hash and compare it to the message. So it's like, wow, you can fiddle with that, and nobody even knows you're fiddling with it. So that's bad. Question? Ah. OK. So Beast, it's actually a client-side vulnerability. Um, but look how many lovely versions of the protocol it affects. So just based on that, uh, yeah, I don't like any of those anymore. Also man in the middle attack, uh, allows the attacker to guess about the nature of the data. Um, and there was actually a mitigation server side which said like, yeah, we'll just, okay, we won't use CPC, we'll switch to RC4. And then of course later RC4 was found to have a problem. So that mitigation had to go out the window. Uh, fortunately, by that time, uh, on the browser side, they'd come up with a, they call it the 1n minus 1 split technique, which I think just makes it much harder for people to know what's happening. Uh, increase the number of paths available. And don't ask me to do the maths, please. So when you say it allows the type of to guess the nature of the data? So, we talked about, you might have missed the first part. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. So, quick recap, you've got the data coming in, the plain text, and then you've got encrypted version of it. 
which is now hard to, to determine. And we just spoke about oracles at the beginning, and oracles allow you to figure out what's going on here. Indirectly, you can't say uh, what is the what is the encrypted doc, what's the plain text that was encrypted. What you can do is you can start making guesses uh, and make a guess. And in fact, I'm going to speak about one. Which is probably a nice example. And let's see. There we go. This is a good one. So this is one of the ways to do it. Uh, so you add a guest a guest sequence. So you take a guess. It's like I'm going to add this to the secret, i.e. the encrypted bit. And you look at the compression before and afterwards. And you, you well for each attempt rather, uh, I guess this added to this. And you look at the compression, the resulting compression ratio. And okay, you try the next thing. I'm going to guess maybe this shape now. And I'm like, does it match? And if you think about how compression works, when you've got similar things, you get better compression. So the better the compression, the closer is your guess to what the, the secret is. Uh, same with fiddling with the padding. The closer you get, uh, you can start working out how long the message is, things like that. You're inferring things, uh, and basically data is being leaked, and that's why it's called an oracle. I don't know if that answers the question. Starting, some of the stuff takes a while to settle, so we can do Q&A afterwards. Let me go back a couple we were there. So, this one uh, got a special mention due to that point there. So SSL v2, I think we've already established that SSL v2 is not a good idea. Say 1996 or something like that. Um, it's actually, if you go read the RFCs, they say like, do not use SSL v2, do not use SSL v3. So then you've got v2 running on say your email server and you've got uh, TLS running on your uh, web server and you're using the same private keys on both, perhaps, for to be able to use the same certificates. Maybe you've got a wildcard cert. You know, things like this happen. It's very real, real world examples. What's interesting about this is you can actually use it as an oracle, uh, this, the various flaws that are in SSL2, to attack a TLS or Quick, which is Google's uh, protocol. And yeah, disable v2. Because what's happening is you're starting to use the uh, information that you can gain from leakages from SSL v2 to figure out what's happening with a TLS session. So even though your web server is running TLS, uh, you manage to get things using the SSL v2 to then attack TLS. So it's, yeah, I suppose like what one one bad apple spoils the bunch, right? And if the barrel rotten apples. Um, nice to name, easy to pronounce CVE, I'm ready. Uh, so this is basically another open SSL implementation error. So it's not actually the fault of TLS. I like point two. For 16 years, <coughs> it's a long time. Attackers could request what's called a change cipher spec. Uh, well, there we go. I don't want to speak this nice, strong cipher anymore. I want to speak three days and like use a short cipher, short key links. And okay, says the server. Once you're speaking 40 bit, three days or something like that, then it becomes okay. My my laptop can. You know, decrypt that. Uh, remediation, just upgrade to the version which has got the proper handshake and it doesn't allow for an attacker to uh, inject change cipher spec requests. Uh, okay, another padding oracle one. So you see, like, the padding th uh, theme is coming up more than once. So we'll get back to this in the future. Uh, AES in CBC mode, that will also be on a nice little. Uh, this a bit later as well. Uh, basically, the decryptor did not always validate uh, the MAC, which I mentioned at the beginning, which is the authentication, well, not the authentication, it's the checksum of the message, which gets encrypted, other bit you missed. Um, and again, leak information about the padding validity. And I bolded that for a reason. It's not giving the same message each time. So you like try something as the attacker, you make a bit of a guess and just messing with the message, and you don't get the same message each time. Like, so if you think about when you log in, you type a login name and the error message you get from a decent login program, it does not say something like incorrect username or incorrect password. It says incorrect username or password. Because if it says incorrect username when you have the incorrect username, that will actually allow you to infer when you have, well, you'll know very obviously when you have the correct username because it won't fail and say incorrect username anymore. So careful what you tell people, I suppose. Okay, we did this one out of order. So how do we check uh, service for vulnerabilities? And there are various ways. Yes, you can use Nmap to figure out what version of SSL you're using, and I don't really recommend that because that's only the first. Of
use a, a specific tool built for the job. Um, I've actually got an output of two of this. I know if the network is disabled here, but we can still take a look in a bit. Um, SL Labs, very comprehensive. Uh, the guy who runs it actually knows what he's doing as well. Published a lot of papers, uh, provides hardening guides as well, which you can go look at. Uh, only thing is, it has to be public. It has to have a uh, slides will be available later, by the way. Um, it has a limitation or two. Uh, one is, it has to be on port 443. It's literally made for public facing web servers. They expect you to, can't use an IP address, you have to have a registered DNS name. One of the checks they want to check is that you know the name on the certificate matches your you know host name slash you know or fully qualified domain name. Um, another alternative, uh, these guys are not quite as fussy. Allow you to do other ports as well, which is useful if you've got something like a you know, I don't know what lives on eight four four three. Pretty much every Java web server I've ever seen seems to want to be on that port rather than four four three. Um, and sometimes they left that way for a reason. Maybe something else is using port four four three. Um, if you want to have a look and see what's going on, then you have to point a different port, then, yeah, yo. Two reasons. Well, basically, the big reason for that is uh, typically your web server that starts up as a privileged user. He can bind to ports less than 1,024. Mm. But a service like Tomcat that you mentioned, they start up as a non-privileged user. They can't bind to anything less than 1024, so they have yeah. to bind to something bigger than 1,000. 24. That's why Tomcat binds to 80, 80 and 84. You'll see it a lot. Um, if you look at who owns it, it'll be like uh, Tomcat or JBoss will be the, the the owner of the process that's running. It'll also hold for something like uh, Kubernetes. You use SSL in between uh, containers to talk to each other. Um, yeah, these do want uh, public IPs. So we'll have a look at some stuff there. When you're looking internally and you don't have a publicly uh, accessible server, you use something like test ssl.sh. It's actually written in bash. No surprise, really, I suppose. It's .sh. Maybe it's going to use born shell. Uh, useful for internal servers because you can point it at something. I've got one of those examples to show you afterwards. Uh, testing browsers. Kind of not really interesting for most people, but if you're in an IT shop and you're trying to make sure that your fleet of 10,000 devices out there, and you're trying to come up with a proper build that works, uh, that you've actually locked down the browser or configured it correctly or patched it. Or then these kind of little, uh, you know, how's my SSL? SSL labs, the same guys who have the server test have one for the browsers, just to see that you know, if you're going to push out a config for, as I said, 10,000 machines, that it's actually going to be doing something useful. So if you were paying attention in the uh, text, you might have noticed that, yeah, you probably shouldn't be using SSL 2 or 3 versus trying to avoid this one as well. Um, as I mentioned, Beast, uh, which is actually you know, mitigate these days by the client side, but still, you know, that's not a good sign. Um, and also, it's really old by this point. Let me say 1999, so, yeah. Uh, and when we talk about TLS 1.3 in detail, then you'll see why uh, legacy is not so good. So, if you see the, especially the top two, you know you've got problems. Bottom one, yeah, things aren't that great. So, some of the cryptographic pr primitives to avoid. Null cipher. It actually does exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> I mean, it's null. Right? It's zero. There is no encryption happening at all. I don't know why we need these things. Maybe for debugging or something. I don't know. High performance group. There's no encryption though. So it's like, okay. No, no. Uh, yeah. I actually, it's one of those ones that I want to discuss. Yeah. We talk like uh, to S or not to S. It's the HTTP. Yeah where these sort of things, when do you encrypt and when don't you encrypt, when is it not useful to encrypt? It? Well, we're definitely not going to cover that in this talk. So we'll so leave that one open. So it's like, um, what was that uh, JavaScript-based secure messaging platform? JWT. <coughs> JSON Web Tokens. You're talking yeah. the one where they kept chopping the, the key that, link um, down. Yes, that one. Oh. Um, that, Edward Snowden was using and then decided it wasn't a good idea. Anyway, so they had performance issues, clients were complaining, well, people who were using it were complaining about it, so they just kept making the, the, <laughs> the sizes smaller, but like random numbers, not even like, oh, so, uh, you know, eight isn't working, so let's go to seven, six, or Yeah, and thereby weakening the actual encryption, yeah. 
no, what do you call that? Like a business decision that overrides a, overrides a technical decision where you know encryption is kind of a it's called user experience. There yeah. we go. User experience versus <laughs> user security. Like <coughs> good trade-off, right? Like we're looking after our users and throwing them under the bus at the same time. Uh, sorry, say so, yeah. No, okay. Just, I was just going to make a uh, snipe against the devs there. Were you a dev? Weren't you a dev? Um, I haven't been a dev, that's all. Like, yeah, then you can get away with it. Uh, anonymous Diffie Hellman, so it's no authentication. I uh, mentioned right at the beginning, authentication is one of the useful things you can get out of it, out of uh, TLS at least. Uh, weak ciphers, uh, 40, 56 bits, just, they're just too short. You can brute force them, basically. It's like, in this day and age, that's way too short. Uh, export ciphers, insecure, again, very weak, there's problems with them, they can be brute forced. Three days, I mean, this is old as the hills, right? Originally, what, days, start encryption standard, and then it became three days, repeated three times, and yeah, it was broken years ago on commodity hardware. Forget who actually built uh, the specific hardware, they built hardware for the task, Can you remember? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? They actually built something to target it. It was like fifty thousand. Yeah, and it was a relatively small budget. It was like fifty thousand dollars or something. And you know, like for you know, for a, a large corporate, to spend fifty thousand dollars is nothing. For a go for governments, it's like they don't even think about that kind of money. It's like whatever. Um, RC four. You know. Ooh, yeah. Special mention. The NSA. So uh, I like it when we get inf access to information for what's going on on the other side. And there have been some recent leaks, Vault 7, and that's what the, that's what the CIA has been doing. CIA has been doing. And if you read some of these papers, you find that they were talking to somebody else, like the NSA. And so both the CIA and the NSA involved, right? And they have uh, encryption standards for their own tools to exfiltrate data. So they've got this tool, it's installed in somebody's network after they've got in, got through, I don't know, physical access, compromised, unpatched box, what have they done? Now they want to get data out. So they've got their own standards. Uh, they're supposed to encrypt their data, etc. And they actually mentioned RC4, and this is going back a few years because these uh, docs were dumped from a while back. I think it was about 2013 they said you mustn't be using it anymore. But they said, if you are using it, definitely do not use the first I think it was three kilobytes, four kilobytes of data. So they already knew that there were big, big problems. But they're supposed to just sit on it, don't tell anybody else. Uh, obviously, it's advantageous for them to be able to use that same vulnerability to get into places or get hold of and you know, decrypt something, get the important information. Maybe you get usernames and passwords out of some encrypted stream it's right at the beginning of a session maybe. Things like that. So on to trying to harden your deployment to prevent a lot of these things. So using strong keys. I'm talking about the keys that you generate uh, for the servers right at the beginning. Uh, but that leads to the CSR which leads to the cert. Guard them well. It's no point having nice, good, strong keys and uh, oh, put them on every server. Oh, like yeah, oh here we go. Put them, check them into the Git repo or something. Uh, publish that on online GitLab. It's not what you want to be doing with keys. It's like keep them secret. Uh, if you can put put passphrases on them, great. You know, so I understand sometimes it's very difficult for certain systems. I don't want to start up. Um, uh, good host name coverage. This is talking about when you actually get a certificate. It should actually mention. For example, if you've got like a Git server at yourdomain.com, uh, if the certificate is for yourdomain.com or www.yourdomain.com, then when you have git.domain.com or so yourdomain.com, it's going to be a certificate error. And the last thing you want to do is start encouraging people to, yeah, accept certificate error, yeah, trust the site, yeah, override. Uh, I mean, the whole system starts to break down at that point, so don't do that, please. Uh, have a good CA. There are but a few fly by night, see, not quite fly by night. I believe there's, I shouldn't mention nationalities, I believe there was at least though a Chinese uh, CA kind of started like saying, oh, you want to like sell certs and outsourcing their ability to issue, well, outsourcing, reselling their ability to issue certs to other people, you know, because their uh, root certs were in, you know, browsers. Who was it recently that got panned by Google? Semantic. Semantic, yes. Smart. 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 Start SSL. Yeah. The issue there is the big issue there is that um, Start SSL and that Chinese user, they started working together and there was an ownership change. And because of that ownership change, that is one of the reasons why Mozilla and those guys nailed it. 
Yeah. For that, not repairing that and sorting that issue out. Yeah. That is a big issue. <coughs> yeah. Iran has a CA. Say again? Iran has its own CA. Yeah. But it is not. <laughs> so, yeah, well, it's about trust, right? Remember, I said it's a chain of trust in the beginning. So, you know, if you have a CA that's dodgy and you're deploying certs on that, the most trusted one in Iran, I'm sure. It depends where you are, right? In Iran, not in Iran. Yeah. Uh, so, use strong algorithms. Uh, so, as of 2017, uh, currently, in other words, it's SHA-256. Before, that used to be you know, less than SHA-256. SHA-1 or something like that, which is like 116 or something. Uh, continuing harder your deployment, uh, so use complete cert chains. So if you have certificates and you have intermediate certs, include the intermediate cert. It's not a big thing. The CA sends them to you for a reason. You need them. Use uh, secure protocols. You mentioned to, we're talking about TLS and SSL. So don't use SSL v2. Don't use SSL v3. I'm pretty sure I made that very clear. So you should be using TLS 1.2 right now. By now, it was released what nine years ago. If you're using a, something that has does not understand that specification, it must be really, really old, or somebody who implemented really didn't care that much, which is bad. You kind of need to care because security is hard to do right. Strong ciphers, uh, I mentioned don't use DES, for example. Uh, there's a few more that'll come up towards the end of the talk uh, of bad examples, but I mean, if you're looking at using decent elliptic curve stuff, that's good. If you're using RSA and using like you know, 2000, 3,000. 3,072, hey? There we go. So longer key lengths. Uh, uh, use perfect forward secrecy. I mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, the difference between being able to, after the fact, decrypt everything versus being able to decrypt like the one session that you have the one session key for that you've managed to compromise. Uh, and use strong Diffie Helmet for key exchange. Uh, it was kind of right at the beginning where we're exchanging keys. Uh, you know, if you're going to use weak keys here, then like you're being a bit silly, like the whole process of that's a bit flawed. As in somebody can figure out what your keys were, which is bad for security. Uh, using TLS uh, encryption everywhere. So if you have a web server and you've got a web page or website, sorry, on it, uh, do not have parts of it which are HTTPS and parts of which are HTTP. Uh, do not mix content. Things like JavaScript, images, uh, CSS. Uh, if you're pushing those over uh, HTTP and you're pushing the other assets over HTTPS, you know, you're just going to cause some problems. Uh, no question. Thank you, mate. Uh, okay, cool. So let's check. Um, please do set the secure cookie flag. Uh, use content security policy. Uh, some of this is coming from the OWASP trans uh, transport layer cheat sheet. Uh, it's a very, very long list. Show you very briefly what I'm talking about. So this is one of the problems, I suppose, about security. You've got to do it right, and there can be quite a bit. So notice some of the examples, some of the things to do. I mean, I like keeping uh, sensitive data out of the URL. That seems like a good idea. If you're going through the trouble of encrypting it, like you know, putting the username and the password in the URL, seems like a very bad idea. <laughs> some people do some strange things. So, yeah, there we go, hey? Decoded, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's like one way, right? Like nobody ever, there's no such thing as base 64 decode, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think uh, one thing I would like to just inject there, if you yeah. scroll up, that one thing people forget sometimes to do is that strict, uh, it's pretty strict transport security. Yeah. That's such a basic basic thing. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that? No. I don't. There's a nice, there's a nice whole long thing there. Right. So basically, it just says, it no. just says if this browser. Has I think we're not even halfway through the talk. If the browser has actually seen HTTPS used in this domain, always mm. go for default port. Yeah. And then don't allow it to go back to HTTP. Mm. Yes, and but but and that comes to the part of to S or not to S. Yes. Yeah. But there's there's some issues there with yeah. that, but that's a different yeah. thing. Yeah. But the idea there is that when you force it on a certain domain, yes, yeah. then you will always use that or that type of domain. Right. That makes sense. But it, it's not always such a simple thing to consider for when you want to send out stuff that is supposed to be cacheable that is not needed to be encrypted. Yeah. Then HSTS might be a pain in the backside. Uh, interesting when you want to read about the fun for moving from HTTP to HTTPS is what the stack exchange, their uh, write up 
on their move to HTTPS and the fun and games. And I think HTTPS is one of those things which I say, are we going to use that, yes or no? No at this point in time, perhaps in the future. Yeah. So one of the takeaways though, it's like you're hitting page down. See, there's quite a few things that you want to be doing. And we're covering some of this in this talk. Uh, and some of it I'm just leaving out because we do not have a whole week to uh, be here. Uh, oops, sorry. That one. Oh, whatever. Uh, great, now I just want to do a slideshow. Yeah. There we go. That one. It's because it knew I had one. It's very clever, cleverer than I am. I'm going to have a bit of beer in me. Um, so, <laughs> the future. Um, one of the things I'm actually really excited about, TLS version 1.3. So, in the almost nine years since TLS version 1.2, some things have happened. A lot of bad things, actually. I think I mentioned it was on draft 20 already. When I looked in March, it was on draft 19. So, you can kind of see every three months or so, there seems to be a new draft. Um, got a few nice principles, though, that they're trying to adhere to. So, simplify and fortify. So to simplify, manage the complexity, I mentioned this right at the beginning, but they're actually uh, weighing up everything uh, and going, like, oh, what's the benefit of this, what's the cost of it in terms of complexity versus added security, uh, if you're making things more and more complicated, somebody's probably going to, well, you're increasing the likelihood <coughs> that the implementation is going to mess it up. Uh, a couple of the key uh, improvements is, one is faster, which is always nice to hear, and two, it's more secure. And we'll take a look at how they did it. Uh, so in terms of speed, if you look here, uh, let's just see, you can't see the little dashed no, lines on the screen, this. but if you count the number of hops, right, so it's like 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's TLS 1.2, so you know, backwards and forwards, and it adds up, right, so that's how you get to 300 milliseconds. On the equivalent network, if you're only and going to... And that is after your TCP IP and check. Yeah. Uh, and before you start doing any application stuff. So kind of in that little bit there. So one, two, three, four, five. So save 100 milliseconds. So it can be useful. Uh, obviously it depends on the speed of your network. If you're on a really fast network, you're actually saving less time because your round trips don't hurt you so, so much if your latency is like whatever, five milliseconds or something. And so they're doing something similar to uh, HTTP 2, which is doing yeah. multiplexing. I'm not going to talk about HTTP 2. It's for another talk, but it's good stuff as well. Uh, I will actually let me just think about this one. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do they? In fact, let's leave that up there. So, how do they do this? Right. I think is probably one of the, the interesting things to talk about while we're here. So here we say, hey, I'm here, and like, what do you speak? And like, oh, I can speak this. You're like, oh, okay, I can speak this. Cool. Like, do you agree? Yes, we agree. Okay. Da, 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 da. On TLS one to three. It's the, the client takes a bit of a guess. It says to the server, hey, you know, I speak TLS 1.3 and I think this is a good uh, cipher to go for, etc., etc. And it's taking a bit of a guess that the server's going to be happy with that. And when it gets it right, the server goes, yep, that's a good cipher. I've got it. I like it. And let's go for it. And it's already got that information from the client, what the client can support. It knows what it can support. So it can send back straight away, like, here we go. Here's my public key, etc. And instead of us, Instead of the old version of, here yeah, I'm the client, ask the server what does it speak, oh this is what I speak, oh okay cool, out of those, I like that one, okay cool, let's use that one, you know, conclude the handshake. So it's just, they've really thought about it a lot and used the practice and the or practical lessons they've learned from the implementation of one or two. So if the client asks the server about one and it doesn't say it, then it goes back to 300 milliseconds. So. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, difference between 1.3 and 1.2, uh, forward secrecy. Uh, so both of them actually good relative to the certificate. So 1.2, 1.3, yeah, always have forward secrecy for the, for the certificate. For the ticket key, which I'm talking about the session now, uh, except at the beginning of the zero round trip time one, they have an option to resume, uh, which is basically zero. It's like, oh, look, yeah, and I forget exactly how, but it's using the last session key plus a pre-agreed upon value. You know, don't quote me, go look it up. But the point is you can, without going backwards and forth, do a negotiation just so like, hey, we already know each other, we already know what we speak, da -da -da, carry on uh, the session that we had before. Um, 
So better than 1.2 in that respect. Uh, some bits I mentioned earlier. Uh, 1.3 also removes a lot of stuff. And it removes them for good reasons, like MD5 and SHA-1. Like, yeah, you don't want to be using those because, well, there are problems. Go look at slot 2016 to find out why. Uh, RC4, we spoke about that in detail a bit earlier. It's broken. You, know, you can literally pull data out of it, especially in the first bit. We know three days is very badly broken. It's just too weak to be practically useful. Uh, AES CPC, oh, look how many fun things that ha happened because of that. So that was clearly not an idea that worked out too well. Just, you know, the beast vulnerability, Lucky 13, I'm missing a Y, Poodle, and there were a few more. I can only fit so many on the slide before it starts to wrap around, so I just said, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's that bad, really. It's, uh, uh, this one, again, you know, like, I think it was actually about three or four that I could find for that one. It's, so what they've done is looked at, okay, we had TLS 1.2. We were trying these things, uh, or we permitted these things, and they were abused horribly. <laughs> And there were bad problems that came out of them. So let's remove them because it just, the benefit wasn't there. Like it was costing too much in terms of security. Um, same with compression, like I mentioned, the crime one, the crime vulnerability. Uh, renegotiation has been abused, uh, it's been replaced with something far simpler. Uh, it's called resumption. Uh, all the export string ciphers are just gone because it just, again, it leads to problems. Like if you have weak crypto, somebody's going to abuse it somehow. Either there's a downgrade attack. Or through bad luck, you know, that's what gets uh, negotiated down to. Uh, people just don't bother to upgrade their clients because, you know, like, oh, my web browser works because all the web servers are going to keep letting me use SSL v2 or something. It's like, it's a bad, bad idea. Just don't do that. So, uh, remove some more things. <laughs> so, arbitrary Diffie Hellman groups, uh, which led to this vulnerability and exploit. Uh, arbitrary curves, uh, something I'd like to touch on a bit more. Uh, it's a very nice thing called safe curves, if you're interested in elliptic curve cryptography. It's about the, uh, picking the actual curves which are used to you know, get those magic numbers which are used uh, for your encryption. And basically the analysis showed that there's a lot of curves out there which don't meet certain criteria which are useful for encryption, or required for encryption, but just useful. So yeah, um, by not specifying arbitrary cur curves, implementations can pick known good curves rather than a standard that somebody has set for them, which could be bad. I suppose the flip side is they could also pick something that's weak. Uh, export strength ciphers, yeah, as I mentioned, gone. Yeah. They actually went through a formal verification. There's a mathematical kind of formal evaluation, which is a really good thing. We, we're using maths here. Uh, they actually analyzed the state machine, they analyzed the, the different modes. They got these guys involved early in the process. Uh, of specifying 1.3. Uh, apparently it was incredibly useful feedback. I think they simplified uh, quite a few things and some great talks on TLS 1.3. You can normally find the Cloudflare guys talking about it, by the way, online videos. Uh, they talk about these things. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, Simplify and Fortify, they're weighing up the benefit of everything versus the complexity of it. You don't want to add more complexity than you're going to gain security from it. As I mentioned, limitation, faults. And as I was starting off, they learned a lot of lessons from these various attacks. Things that were not a good idea have been proved to be bad ideas and uh, moved them. So, you cannot move the mountain. Well, not easily, you know, enough dynamite or nuclear weapons or something, you can move anything, but uh, you can go around the mountain pretty easily. So, grabbing unencrypted data. So, remember I mentioned those few things right at the beginning, like using oracles or side channel attacks? This is probably even further, like, I don't know, side, side channel. Uh, basically, the example for the Xbox there, and there's a great talk. I think, Hendrik, you were the guy who, like, put me onto this talk. I'm not covering anything else. I'll talk for another time, in case you want to give it still. But uh, <laughs> two examples. On the Xbox, they had some really good uh, encryption on a lot of the system. And then they also had the hypertransport bus, which is an awesome bus. It's really, 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 really quick. You push a lot of data over it very quickly. And the thinking at the time was, well, you know, nobody can actually, you know, to get hold of a hyper-transport bus analyzer is pretty much impossible. In fact, it is, you know, like, you know, unless you're building the thing, like AMD's got one, because they built, you know, came up with hyper-transport, and Intel's probably got something as well to try and, you know, be able to, you know, like, it's not going to be a problem, right? 
until somebody repurposed some really nice high-end equipment at MIT which did some similar stuff and managed to start sucking the data off and I believe he was looking on the South Bridge which for those of you who like chipsets and motherboards and things is not on the CPU side but on the other side far away from the CPU and just it's a little bit slower and easier to grab things off there it's not as much data and voila he managed to actually pull out the nice encrypted ROMs that they hidden really well and overwrote and did all sorts of fancy tricks to try and keep safe. Yeah, just read it off the bus somewhere else when it wasn't encrypted. So, didn't use an oracle, you know, wasn't doing power analysis, just read the data off. Um, so OTR off the record, a cool thing. Uh, basically, you can overlay in encrypted chat sessions over unencrypted chat sessions. So, for example, uh, using uh, Jabber or is it for example, on Google Talk, then you can point Pigeon at it in this specific example, which uses a library called libpurple, which happens to be perhaps not so well implemented. And if you're grabbing the text from libpurple before it goes into the OTR plugin and it's getting encrypted, well, then you're getting the plain text. And again, I'm not doing tinfoil hat, the CIA's <laughs> recent was it revelation? revelations have uh, pointed out that. Yeah, you can't really break WhatsApp and Telegram and all these things, at least not trivially or easily. What you can do is compromise the device and read it off the device. It's going through the Android software keyboard, right? For example, on an Android device. And same, similar will be happening on Apple. And if you're going to grab it directly then, you don't need to decrypt it. You've got it in the plane. So Part just of it is because OTR, if I remember correctly, takes the <coughs> previous key and the current key and combines it to make a future next key mm. so you can't you're not constantly using the same key so they can't pin the same message necessarily to you every time yeah. so they can compromise like it perfect, once but perfect the next, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the next one they screw yeah. it's true and, um, so you, you are making so basically what, what you can take away from that though is that if you're going to go through the effort of hacking people's phones to be able to get hold of the data before they send it into whatsapp or telegram or you're going to break into the computer and start pulling data out of loop purple, you know, the library that the chat client is using instead of trying to decrypt the OTR. It probably le means that's probably less work than it is to try and break the encryption. So encryption has some uses. Uh, so another reason small positive. the NSA would be going after your actual devices, uh, uh, the University of New York accidentally put uh, manuals and design specifications for a supercomputer that they can say contracted IBM for that's using a, um, about 80,000 ASICs to crack things. They didn't say what, but you can only guess it's either cracking encryption or password. So they're selling that, which is version 3. <laughs> of the original one. So they've gone through three different expensive iterations. They're selling it to the UK at a hundred million dollars for that cluster. Yeah. So, so this hacking to phones versus a yeah. hundred million. So just to clarify a couple of things, maybe just for the people who are going to watch later. Uh, so ASIC applications, uh, specific integrated circuit. So what you're typically doing there is you're taking specific uh, CPU instructions, calculations, and you're implementing them in hardware. So it becomes much, much, much quicker than using the generalized portion of the CPU but to try and a good run example, software. SHA-256, you optimize yeah. the CPU to do hashes. Yeah. Well, that's exactly it. This application, specific circuitry, is actually built to do those things very well, which would otherwise take a lot longer on a general CPU. So don't think like, oh, it takes me on my latest, uh, whatever, AMD Ryzen 7 platform or Intel, you know, Xeon equivalent type platform to you know, crunch through this data, it's like, yeah, they're not using the general purpose pathways. They're not trying to do it in software. They're doing it in hardware that's made just why, like a switch. can switch packets really, really quickly. There's dedicated circuitry that is built to switch packets. It's not like some software that's written. I mean, I know these days CPUs are fast enough and you get software to find networks and things like that, but routing, etc., encryption, you know, go up the stack of difficulty and still, if FPGAs, ASICs become worth it. So. That's pretty much it for me. Uh, questions, stories, corrections, no rotten tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So, you said that TLS 4.3 dropped quickly. Yep. Uh, Mozilla and Google already included that in their browsers. 
Yes, that's actually a good point. Um, and, uh, nice thing to talk about. Already actually serving, uh, yep. TLS 1.3. Uh, You're 100% correct. Uh, and the explanation for that is they've the drafts have been available for some time. Is it you know draft 